my Aunt Rachel practically raised me. After a lengthy battle with a terminal illness, she passed last year, leaving what little she had left after the hospital bills were paid. I was to take care of her cockatiel parrot, tugboat, and her collection of 50s cartoon-themed collective plates. Basically, the only two items that couldn't be easily sold at an auction. If you saw the plates, you'd see why. Downright creepy things. One in particular, a plate portraying a young cartoon girl feeding apples to a giant frog. It's like the whole thing was made by two different people. The girl looked positively cartoon-like, while the frog was more, I don't know, uncomfortably realistic. It was such an odd item that there had to be a collector looking for it somewhere. I was sure of it. Yet for weeks, I couldn't find anyone even remotely interested. I posted pictures of the plate on pretty much every social media account I had, along with a few auction sites, but there were no takers. There were no markings or stamps indicating year or brand, unlike the other plate, and I was starting to think it was custom made. I couldn't stand looking at it, so I put it in a box in the garage. The others went up on my kitchen wall. My aunt would have wanted it that way. I live in a house not too far from the lake, on the outskirts of a small Minnesota town. There are a few houses in the nearby area, but I couldn't even hit the closest neighbour's yard with a rock if I tried. There's only a single street light that works outside, and that thing is flimsier than our summer weather. I rarely have any visitors, as this place can be a bit too out of the way, even for my friends to come by. I inherited this place from my mum, who passed away when I was younger. I'm one of the lucky house owners of my generation, but at what cost? My aunt's bird, tugboat, fit right in. It was easy for me to fix in a big cage in one of the back rooms. When you're living on your own in a place like this, you got more space than you know what to do with. My aunt's funeral was simple. She'd insisted she paid for it herself so it had to be as basic and cheap as could be. She hated the thought of ever being a burden, and she practically begged me to take care of Tugboat. You don't say no to that, you just don't. Besides, that bird was damn near the only thing that kept me sane through the troubles of 2020. Having lived in an empty house, you learn to identify most sounds across the property. The hum of the fuse box, the buzzing kitchen lights, the noise from the fridge against the backdrop of a TV that's been on for way too long without anyone watching. This was the only reason I ever really took notice that one night when this all started. I was turning on my electric toothbrush one night, only to notice it was completely silent. The motor was running, I felt the vibrations and I saw it spin, but there was no sound not a peep. Yet, I could still hear the TV in the other room, just fine. Over the next few days, there were several of these odd instances. Once, the egg timer went off but didn't make a sound, causing me to overboil my breakfast. I thought the ventilation was broken once, as it turned out to have just gone quiet. Hell, at one point I dropped one of my aunt's collective plates. It shattered against the ceramic tiles, yet didn't make any noise. I was starting to think I was going deaf, but the two doctors I spoke to confirmed my hearing was just fine. Still, the mental image of seeing that falling plate and expecting a loud crash, only for it to remain silent, there was something eerie to it. A friend of mine, Patrick, works for the sheriff's department. We usually had lunch once a week to catch up, but that tradition teetered off during 2020. This time, I met him at the supermarket, but I barely even noticed him. I'd been having trouble sleeping and getting to work on time, as my alarm clock sometimes stayed silent for no apparent reason. My boss wasn't too happy, so I had to start using a vibration alarm. Patrick Elbow bumped me by the fruit aisle, snapping me out of my thoughts. 
Hey there, he said, grabbing a handful of oranges. You doing okay? Yeah, sorry, didn't see you there. These are crazy times, he said. I heard about Rachel. I'm sorry I couldn't make the funeral. That's okay, I nodded. She never was much for men in uniform. Patrick laughed. We went our separate ways and finished our shopping, only to meet in the parking lot outside. We'd managed to park next to each other without even realising it. He leaned against the hood of his car. Hey, have you seen any strangers around? After this year, you all seem like strangers. You know what I mean, he chuckled. Strangers, passers-by. No, sorry, I don't get out much. Some of your neighbours have had problems, you know. Be careful. Problems? He looked at me like a deer in the headlights. You don't know. Apparently, there'd been reports of a thief. First, they thought it was raccoons, as someone had gone through the trash cans. But raccoons don't try to pick locks. They also don't leave food behind, or human-sized handprints on the windows. Some people had reported seeing a woman with tangled hair roam about, but the police hadn't managed to find her. This is what made me start looking more closely at my own property. I'd noticed the garbage can lid had gone missing, but I hadn't given it much thought. Also, I could have sworn there were handprints on my car on one dewy morning. I tried to tell myself it was all paranoia, but after what Patrick said, it seemed that everything was a clue or a warning. In my mind, the strange woman was lurking behind every corner. I tried to put it out of my mind. One night, as I heard Tugboat sing his interpretation of Earth, Wind and Fire's September, I took an extra long shower. As I was scrubbing my hair clean, my head went quiet. I could feel the water touching my skin, but it made no sound. Through the door, I could still hear the bird sing his heart out. You'd be surprised how cold warm water can feel when you've got ice in your veins. I rinsed off most of the shampoo and stepped out. There's a small frosted glass window in my bathroom. The silhouette of a pale face was pressed against it. I screamed, but no sound came out. Tugboat kept singing in the other room, unaware. I grabbed my robe and ran into the kitchen to call Patrick, but I couldn't hear anyone pick up on the other end of the line. I couldn't hear my own words when I spoke. And there, just outside the kitchen window, was the silhouette of an intruder trying to find their way in. A pair of unevenly sized eyes stared at me, slightly too far apart. As our eyes met, she bolted, probably heading for the back door. I picked up my keychain. Tugboat stopped singing from the other room as he sensed something was wrong. As my hearing returned, I could hear the comforting sound of sharp metal from my kitchen knife as I pulled it from a drawer. My pulse was running away from me. It's one thing to think of a home invasion, but to live it violates every thought of privacy and safety you have. It was turning real, fast. There was a large sliding glass door leading out to the backyard, and I figured if there ever came an intruder, it'd be through there. The same room where Tugboat chirped away, but now he'd gone quiet. I ran in there, still fresh out of the shower, my knife held in a cramped, forced grip. I almost convinced myself I was ready to use it. There she was, just outside the door, pale, with unkempt hair, eyes of different sizes, slightly too far apart, dressed in what looked like a hospital gown. She was malnourished and frail, but something told me she had the strength of a madwoman. Her eyes darted back and forth, searching for something. As they landed on me, she opened her wide mouth to scream. Not a sound came out. As her mouth grew to an unnatural size, I could feel vibrations in the air, like standing next to a concert loudspeaker. 
The sliding glass door shattered, the shards fanning out towards me. The knife in my hand started shaking, but I managed to hold it. She stepped inside, her bare feet smearing ribbons of blood on the hardwood floor. She was coming for me, a constant vibration from an unnatural scream tearing through my body. I had to try to call for help and sprinted back into the kitchen. The light bulbs burst overhead, turning the room black. Still, not a single noise. A stray light from the streets outside made its way through the kitchen window, making the room drip with long, pale shadows. My aunt's collective plates rattled on the wall. Glasses along the kitchen sink were cracking and breaking. Empty bottles spilled onto the floor. Cabinet doors shaking back and forth, opening seemingly at random. An old recipe book fell from a countertop, the pages flicking back and forth. I pressed myself against the kitchen window, fumbling to get it open. She'd cornered me. Her mouth was wide open in that impossible scream, her body vibrating with machine-like intensity, the tangled hair twisting and stretching, as if thrown about in a storm of its own. Her uneven eyes searched for me, twitching like insects, and still she didn't make a single sound. There were no humming fans, no buzzing electricity only a soft breeze outside the window. I couldn't even hear my heartbeat. I managed to stumble out of the kitchen window, stepping onto the sharp gravel path. I still held onto my knife like a comfort blanket. I didn't even bother to see if she followed me. I just ran. There was no time to get into the car. I ran into the woods, following a trail that would lead me to my neighbour. Soon, the rhythmic beat of my feet went quiet, my breath too. I tried to scream for help, but the sound was swallowed. She was right behind me. Long nails reached for me, fingertips touching the edge of my robe. And all around me, nothing but tranquil nature, unbothered by my terror. I was knocked to the ground scraping my legs against the undergrowth. I slashed with my knife, trying to fight her, as a dainty hand picked up my keys from the side pocket of my robe. I rolled away, only to see the mess of tangled hair walk away. Her uneven eyes gave me a last look as she turned her back to me. She looked right through me, without a care in the world. I got to my neighbour. My dirty feet muddied their floor and by the time the police came, it felt like a waking nightmare. I made my statement, showered for the second time that night, and slept at a nearby motel as the police cleared my house. The next day, I assessed the damage. The house had been searched thoroughly, but nothing was stolen. Not too much was broken either. Seems she was looking for something specific, not trying to steal any valuables. The police were just as dumbfounded as I was, and I didn't report anything stolen. My insurance company would need an explanation, though. It was hard to explain why it looked like the house had been hit by a tornado from the inside, without sounding insane. All the collective plates laid shattered on the floor. Poor Tugboat was so traumatised, he since stopped singing. Going through the damages was heartbreaking it made me take notice of something peculiar. The garage had been searched as well. It was pretty much fine though, at least compared to my house. Among my boxes, I noticed a single item missing. The creepy plate I'd put aside from my aunt. The only one I didn't want in the house. The one with the young cartoon girl feeding the giant frog. It was gone. I guess I found the single collector who wanted it.